As we continue our discussion of modeling physics applications and other applications using differential equations, we're going to spend this video talking about acceleration and velocity. The question's going to be how do we model acceleration and velocity? And we've actually already worked with this a little bit in calculus. We're just going to expand on it and make it more real-world application, getting rid of some of the assumptions we had in calculus. But first, I want to remind us of Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that the force exerted by an object is equal to the mass times its acceleration. Now, we already know that acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. And we already know if we're talking about the force of gravity, we're going to make it negative because it's pointing downward towards the Earth. Some mass times the acceleration of gravity, which we represent with g. And that g gravity is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Again, that gravity is an acceleration, so I could write gravity as the change in the velocity with respect to time is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And we actually worked with this in calculus where we said... We didn't really say we were doing a separation of variables, but that's essentially what we did and took 9.8 dt, negative, and when we integrate both sides, it gives us the velocity. Velocity is the antiderivative of the acceleration. And of course, we can find that constant by saying if x or t is 0, the velocity is the initial velocity. So the initial velocity is equal to 0 plus c. And so we end up with this great equation that the velocity is equal to negative 9.8 times time plus the initial velocity. And then we said we could take that one step further because velocity is the derivative of y or the vertical position with respect to time. And so you may remember to figure out the physical position vertically above ground, we would integrate both sides. And what we're really doing there is separating the variables. And integrating both sides to get that y is equal to negative 4.9 t squared plus the initial velocity times time plus a constant. And again, we can find that constant if we use 0 in the initial vertical position, which tells us that actually the initial position is equal to y naught, or the starting position. So we end up with this final equation that the vertical position is negative 4.9 t squared plus the initial velocity times time plus the initial position. And we worked with those quite a bit in Calc 1, Calc 2, and Calc 3. However, all of this made an assumption that there was no air resistance on our item. In a vacuum, these equations would work perfectly. If you drop a rock and a feather, they'll both fall at the same rate because there's no air resistance that's going to impact the feather a lot different than it's going to impact the rock. But if we account for air resistance, it becomes more realistic in the world we live in. So with air resistance, we end up with a total force that is equal to the force from gravity plus the force from the air resistance. If we were to draw a free body diagram on our item, pulling down is going to be the force from gravity 
but pushing against it up is going to be some force from air resistance. And so if we add them together, you get a smaller force. That's the actual force being enacted on the object. Now, Newton did some work for us, and Newton determined that the force from resist air resistance is equal to some constant times the velocity raised to some exponent. And it turns out that that exponent is between 1 and 2. It's closer to 1 for lower speeds and closer to 2 for higher speeds. And for the sake of this video, we're going to play with the example of letting p equal 1, which means the entire force is the force from gravity, which we know is negative mass times gravity, minus a constant times v raised to the p power using Newton's formula for the resistance due to air gravity or air resistance. Well, we know force is equal to mass times the derivative of the velocity, which means what we actually end up with in this case is not a separable equation, but you should recognize this as a linear equation, especially if we add the constant to both sides, the kV constant, and then divide both sides by the mass, we end up with this linear equation. To make the linear equation easier to solve, since the constant divided by mass is going to be another constant, let's just define a new constant. We'll call it rho. Rho is k over m. And so what we end up with is v prime plus rho times v is equal to negative gravity. And that is the linear equation we're going to solve to figure out what the velocity is equal to. Well, with linear equations, we remember we want to integrate the rho dt, which is equal to rho t. And then we're going to multiply both sides by e to that power, e to the rho t. And when we do, the left side is going to become e to the rho t times my dependent variable v, the derivative of that product is equal to negative g e to the rho t. So as we start solving for rho, we integrate both sides, the dt, and we get e to the rho t times v is equal to, uh, the antiderivative of e to the rho t is e to the rho t divided by rho, so we have g divided by rho, plus our constant. Dividing both sides by e to the rho t, we get negative gravity divided by rho plus the constant times e to the negative rho t. Well, again, we'll take an initial value of zero initial velocity. And so we end up with the initial velocity is equal to negative gravity divided by rho plus a constant. So the constant is equal to the initial velocity plus gravity divided by rho. Which means when we put it all together, we get that the velocity is equal to negative gravity divided by rho plus the constant, which is the initial velocity plus gravity divided by rho times e to the negative rho t. And now we've got an equation for the velocity of our object as it drops down to Earth from the sky, given air resistance. Now, 
what we might be interested in is how the speed is going to be impacted. What's interesting is as something is falling, even though it's falling at a certain number of meters per second squared, it's not falling at the same pace it's not accelerating indefinitely. It's actually approaching a specific value. If we were to take the limit as t goes to infinity of our velocity, looking at our equation, we get e to the negative infinity, which is uh, 0. 0 times anything is 0. And so all that we're going to be left with as we take this limit is the opposite of gravity divided by rho. Now you might remember earlier we defined rho. Rho was equal to k divided by m. So if we multiply by the reciprocal, we get negative gravity times m divided by the constant. And this is the maximum speed the object will approach as it falls down to Earth. It'll get closer and closer to it. We call it the terminal speed. Or we'll often use V sub t to represent the terminal speed. Which means we can rewrite our velocity as v equals negative g over rho, which we just said is the terminal speed, plus the initial speed, plus g over rho, which is negative terminal velocity, times e to the negative rho t. And so you'll often see the velocity accounting for air resistance written in this form. Now, this talks about the velocity, but let's take it one step further and actually figure out the position at any given point in time. We know that the velocity is really the derivative of the position with respect to time. So that would be my terminal speed plus v naught minus my terminal speed e to the negative rho t. And if we just separate the variables, dy is equal to the terminal velocity plus the initial velocity minus the terminal velocity e to the negative rho t dt. Integrating both sides gives us y equals terminal velocity times time plus, well, actually, it's going to be minus because we're going to have to divide by negative rho, so we got negative 1 over rho times the initial velocity minus the terminal velocity e to the negative rho t and of course plus our constant. Well we can solve for that constant using the point 0 in the initial y position so that the initial y position is equal to 0 minus 1 over rho times v naught minus vt. e to the 0 is 1 plus a constant. And so we can solve for the constant by adding 1 over rho times the initial velocity minus the terminal velocity. And now that we know the constant, we can plug it in and say y is equal to terminal velocity times time minus 1 over rho times initial velocity minus terminal velocity e to the negative rho t plus the constant, which is y naught, plus 1 over rho times initial velocity minus terminal velocity. And actually, I'm going to clean this up just a little bit. Let's put the y naught term first. And then we've got the terminal velocity times time. Plus, I'm going to factor out of the remaining terms 1 over rho times initial velocity minus terminal velocity. When I do that, what's going to be left from the end is just 1 minus, and then we've got that term in the middle, what's going to be left there is the e to the negative rho t.
And now we have derived the equation for the height of the object falling to Earth under the force of gravity and air resistance. On the assignment today, you're going to be asked to do uh, similar type things using various forms of these equations. You're going to derive the differential equation that can be used to model a certain situation. It might have different values for our exponents, but it's going to be the same idea that we can go through in order to solve our equations. It may be a separable equation, it may be a linear equation, but we know how to solve both of those. So now it's your turn to practice deriving acceleration velocity models on the homework. Good luck!